we start our tours talking about 1847, and that's a significant year in Poplar's history. So that was the first time that anybody did a survey, of, an accurate survey of the island to see how big it was, and they found out it was roughly 1,140 acres. So a sizable island at the time, but then over the course of the next 150 years or so, it started to erode away. We had the wind and the waves crashing down on the island, eating away at the sediment, and the island shrank over time, and by 1993, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers came out to do another survey, and they found off found out it had split off into four little tiny remnant islands, the pinpricks that Dave was talking about, and they added up somewhere between three and five acres. So we say Poplar virtually disappeared due to erosion, and so the Army Corps of Engineers partnered with the Maryland Port Administration to rebuild Poplar back to its 1847 size of roughly 1,100 acres. Um, we the reason the port is involved, they are one of the key players because um, we're rebuilding the island with the dredge material from the shipping channels. The average depth of the Chesapeake Bay is about 20 feet, uh, but those ships need at least 50 feet to navigate safely up to the port of Baltimore. So we dredge the channels every year and we used to do what's called open water placement. They'd spread the sediment out in different parts of the bay, but that's considered to be not so environmentally friendly, covering up bay grasses, oyster beds. Um, so we now are mandated to have a beneficial use of the dredge material. So um, we bring the dredge material here and we're re rebuilding an island that was historically here. We're keeping the shipping channels clear and we're rebuilding really important habitat that was lost right in the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem. So that's kind of the reason for the project in a nutshell. Um, it's federally and state funded. We get 75% of our funding from the Army Corps and 25% from the Maryland Port Administration. And um, Maryland Environmental Service is contracted by the port to oversee all the day-to-day -day operations on the island. Um, <clears throat> so we started construction in 1998, and the first three years was just uh, building the perimeter of the island with the sand and the armor stone. And then we started to inflow in 2001. And inflow is our term for when we're actually receiving the dredge material from the shipping channels onto the island. And we've been inflowing almost every year since 2001. We have been approved to expand. Um, right now, the island is around 1,100 acres, but in a couple of years, we're gonna start an expansion, which is gonna be off the northeast corner of the island, and that'll be an additional 575 acres. So, um, including that expansion, we are roughly about a quarter of the way through in receiving dredge material. We, um, we're supposed to receive 68 million cubic yards of sediment. We've received about 18 million so far. And, Excuse me. Um, so anyway, and including the expansion, um, we hope to be finished inflowing material by the year 2029. But that's not the end of the project. Then we have habitat restoration, construction, and planting to do. So the completion date, projected completion date right now is 2039, to give you an overall perspective of the scope of the project. Um, when it's finished, it's going to be divided in half as far as two types of habitat, upland and wetland. Um, the western side is that upland that we talked about, higher in elevation. It'll look a little bit like Coaches Island over there with all the trees. And then the eastern side of the island, or the majority of the eastern side, will be developed into the intertidal wetlands. And that's really important to us because um, wetlands are an extremely valuable uh, habitat and they're, it's being lost all over the Chesapeake Bay region. So we're giving back tremendously by doing that. We're supposed to have a total of 737 acres of completed wetlands when we're all finished. So very exciting. Okay, in the year 1847, a man named Charles Carroll owned Poplar Island, and he was the grandson of the Charles Carroll that signed the Declaration of Independence. And he was a businessman, and he got the idea that he was going to raise black cats and sell their fur on the black cat fur market in China. He got over a thousand black cats that he raised on Poplar Island. He put an ad in a local newspaper offering 10 cents per cat if he brought it to Tillman Island. He was even um, so concerned with taking care of the animals that he hired a gentleman to go fishing every day and throw fish up on the beach for the cats to eat. It was getting about time for Charles Carroll to cash in on his investment and winter hit. And it was a really, really cold winter out on Poplar Island. So cold that the bay froze over 
and all of those poor cats ran across the ice back to Tillman Island, never to be seen again. Okay, so there were a lot of variables to, you know, how we sighted Poplar Island to, to where it is today, um, starting with the environmental community, the agencies that have behind us on the project, didn't want to see an island just created anywhere in, in Chesapeake Bay. Um, rebuilding an island that had disappeared was was probably the, the most preferred option. Other things that we need into consideration is, is what is the bay bottom, uh, the material, is it, what is the consistency of it? Is it soft enough? Is it too soft to actually construct the island or or is it firm like we need it to be able to support you know, all the rock that we're putting out there uh, to rebuild the island? And the, the other factor is is we obviously want it to be as close to the shipping channels as possible uh, because hauling this material is a costly venture. So uh, we did some studies on islands around the, that mid-Chesapeake area, you know, close to the Bay Bridge as possible, and Poplar Island, uh, came to the top of the list because of the size that it, that it used to be, about 1,100 acres, was big enough that we could create an island that uh, could handle a good amount of dredge material for a long time, as well as build a, a large remote island habitat. Turtle gold Our job at Pop Island Restoration Project is to monitor the flora and fauna that is pioneering the site as it develops. I conduct census for the entire island about every 12 days year-round. And these census are published in Corps of Engineers and Maryland Port Authority papers. The uh, impoundments are particularly interesting. Are a particularly attractive for shorebirds, and shorebirds eat invertebrates, particularly insect larvae, that have an aquatic immature stage, such as mosquitoes and midges. And at times, these insects can be overbearing for those trying to work at the site. However, they're a very large attractant for these shorebirds. Back, um, Probably in 2002 or three, uh, the initial stages of the island, the midges at times in May would be so bad that the personnel driving trucks around the project site had to have their windshield wipers on because there were so many millions of them in the air. We are about to put out some hydrolabs to monitor the water quality in the channels. And um, by water quality, I mean the uh, conductivity, pH, dissolved oxygen, and those are parameters that are important to fish. So they have us monitor the, the uh, particularly the dissolved oxygen. We monitor um, a week to 10 days at a time, a couple of times a year during the warmer months to make sure that the water quality is, the dissolved oxygen is sufficient to support small fish. The dissolved os oxygen concentration that you need uh, for healthy fish, the minimum is four uh, milligrams per liter. At two milligrams per liter, the fish will usually die. So we monitor 24 hours a day, and usually the lowest oxygen concentrations in the water column occur right before dawn because respiration is occurring in the water column all the time, but there's no oxygen generation occurring at night. In Maryland, common terns back in the, the mid-80s, there was a population statewide of about 2,500 breeding pairs. And uh, they nested at some 20 sites throughout the Chesapeake Bay and the coastal bays. Over time, they've declined considerably so that now in the Chesapeake Bay, there's only one nesting site and the total statewide population is only 500 breeding pairs. As the Poplar Island project was designed, we were looking for ways to create habitat for nesting common terns, which require open, barren areas covered with sand or shells. 
and one of the experiments that we tried was to make small islets in the marsh units on Poplar Island surrounded by a moat to make them somewhat predator-free environments, which is what the terms have looked for. This has been uh, successful for the time being. We have terns that use these small created islets in the marsh cells, and uh, that's why Poplar Island is the only common tern nesting site in uh, the Maryland portion of the Chesapeake Bay. But it's an experiment. In the long term, we'll see if, as Poplar Island is developed and vegetated some 20 years out, if the small islets are still used, it would be great. If not, it was successful for a time being, and that's also good because it got the birds through a period when there was a limited amount of other nesting sites for common terns in the bay. Where souls sing the song. In the mid-1990s, in an effort to protect the small nesting colony of water birds, such as herons and egrets, a series of old barges was placed in a semicircular arc around the island to try and protect the island from any further island loss from erosion. Initially, uh, island habitat uh, in the Chesapeake Bay was lost due to sea level rise, uh, wave action, and, and things like that. In the 90s, the Army Corps of Engineers recognized the need to restore island habitat. At the same time, there's a place to actually put dredge material out there that we needed as well. Uh, this combination led to the creation of Popper Island, and in doing so, we began to look at what, what benefits we can serve for the ecosystem of the Chesapeake Bay. The Army Corps of Engineers asked the Fish and Wildlife Service to help them to design project that would be beneficial to wildlife. We sat down and looked at the, the types of habitats that were traditionally in the bay and uh, discussed how we could try best to recreate these habitats and create a wildlife area for the, the birds and the wildlife that were in the bay. And that became Popper Island, as we are seeing today, and will increase in habitat over the next decade or two as we complete the project. Because this cell, this cell is called 4D, was mostly sandy material. They they wanted to have a test run on what might happen if they put finer grain material from the upper bay channels. So they set out four plots for us with varying degrees of, of material in there and with different kinds of tillage practices. In other words, they rototilled it in some places 18 inches deep, sometimes only 6 inches deep things like that. So we have four of these, and each one of them turned out to really grow the plants rather well. In 2002, I was uh, called by Mark Mendelson of the Army Corps of Engineers, um, and he was a little bit panicked on the phone and said to me, I think we have turtles nesting on our island. And I said to him, where is your island? And he said, well, it's in it's Poplar Island, it's in Talbot County. Um, and I said, well, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. And he was very concerned because the turtles were nesting on part of the island where they were actively doing construction and that alarmed him. What um, we've been doing out there since 2002 is we've been uh, working on a daily basis during June and July when the turtles are nesting and we actually locate the nests and um, and uh, we also have constructed a fence that essentially prevents the turtles from getting onto parts of the island where the construction is ongoing. Um, but by locating the nests, we can um, follow those nests throughout their incubation period, which takes about 60 days. And then at the end of 60 days, we place a little um, fence around the nest and catch the hatchlings as they come out of the nest. Now, one of the things that's really neat and for me has been a wonderful opportunity out of Poplar Island is that there are none of the usual predators of terrapin nests. There are no raccoons and no foxes out on the island. They haven't colonized it yet. Fire down in the ocean. So for the past two years, uh, several offices 
uh, within the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration have been collaborating with both the Army Corps of Engineers and the University of, of Maryland at Horn Point. Um, we've been collaborating on um, various projects related to Poplar Island, but especially with regards to how the island, the island's wetlands are going to be keeping pace with local sea level. The, um, the, the island has um, a number of wetland cells that were, that were developed. The cells are self-contained. They have um, uh, water control structures um, that allow the water from the bay to flow in and out of each cell. And the, the, wet, the cells have both open water, shallow open water habitats for fish and other, other uh, aquatic um, um, animals, and it also has wetlands. And um, uh, tidal channels have been built in to feed this water, the tidal water, uh, to feed into the marshes and drain. Uh, construction of these wetlands have been done to try to enhance sedimentation, the ability of sediments to accumulate in the wetlands so that the wetlands will grow vertically over time as sea levels rise, as they continue to rise in the region. Sea level rise is a, a big problem in the Chesapeake Bay. A lot of islands have slowly been eroding away and are being submerged. And uh, so this large investment at Poplar Island uh, is being done in a, in a very strategic way to try to ensure that these habitats that are created will last for generations to come. So not only is the hydrology within each cell forcing uh, sedimentation to occur, but also the island itself is designed with this concept of mini watersheds. Uh, there's a large upland area adjacent to the wetlands, and the idea is eventually when the project is completed, it will be vegetated with trees, a little forest, if you will, and over time, um, as naturally uh, occurs in the environment, erosion will be will be removing some of the sediments from this large upland area and will be feeding sediments into the wetlands, um, mimicking the natural process that occur in a natural watershed. So both sediments from these mini watersheds and sediments from the bay itself will hopefully feed these wetlands in an accelerated process so that the wetlands will be able to keep pace with sea level. So for about two years now, uh, NOAA has been partnering with uh, the Army Corps and the University of Maryland at Horn Point to monitor the elevation change in these wetlands. And over the first two years of data, we have seen uh, an elevation gain in the wetlands. We have been driving stainless steel rods down to refusal in the sediments and establishing these as benchmarks, local benchmarks that are mated to a um, surface elevation table. We usually call them SETs. And these sets are special instruments that will mate to the benchmarks and they allow us to take very fine scale measurements of elevation change down to the millimeter, if you will. So we're chasing millimeters in the marsh, as we say, um, measuring how those surfaces are changing vertically over time. For a star. Far down in the water, you'd think that old turtle duck had lost her mind out there on the edge of time, where all souls would sing the song.